participere i et spillet til sangen til Amen. Uh, so today is one of my uh, more more favorite saints, uh, Saint Margaret of Scotland. Uh, so we're not celebrating her feast today; it's still the octave of Pentecost. But I will um, speak at some length about her life, which is um, quite fascinating, actually. It'd be at, be very good for a movie. Like, they're always making movies these days. You wouldn't even have to add anything. Like, there's enough drama in her life as is. You could just tell the story of her life, and it would be dramatic. Um, it's even got, like, this nice, sad ending. Well, it's not nice, but, well, we'll, we'll find out. Uh, Margaret of Scotland. Um, she was born to Hungarian princess Agatha and her English father, Edward the Exile, in the year 1045. Uh, so she was actually Hungarian born and her father he was there because he had to flee from England uh, about 30 years previously due to the invasion by King Canute the Danish barbarian uh, the Danes invaded England and her father uh, and I think it was even an infant at the time uh, he was taken out of England and so had lived nearly his entire life in exile uh, finally ended up in Hungary married a Hungarian princess and had uh, Margaret, uh, she had uh, another sister and, and a brother. Um, so eventually, the, the, in, back in England, the Danes left in, in the year 1057. Uh, Edward the Exile was recalled to his home country of England. Uh, so his, uh, I think it was like his uh, second cousin once, I, I don't know, his great grandfather had been um, uh, the king, had had two wives, and um, he was descended from the one, and the current king had been descended from the other, and that was Edward the Confessor. So Edward the Confessor was, was nearing death and found out, hey, your long lost you know, second cousin you didn't even know existed is still alive in Hungary. So he called him back and said, I would like to appoint you as heir to the throne. So uh, Margaret, exiled princess, is on her way back to England to live in the royal court as, and her father is the heir apparent. Uh, however, as soon as the family arrives uh, there in England, after 30 years, uh, her father dies mysteriously. Some say it could have been poisoning, but it, 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 it's, it's unclear what happened. Uh, so it seems to be kind of a joyous event, but it actually ends in tragedy. Uh, and they were not treated very well by the, other, uh, by the other nobility. If you can imagine, you know, these people that grown up in England, these noblemen thinking, okay, Edward the Confessor is about to die. He has no children of his own. I'm in line, I'm in line. And suddenly this outsider comes in. You can see how they wouldn't take it very kindly. Uh, so well, this, this made uh, Margaret's um, life rather difficult and her younger brother Edgar was next in line, but he was still just a, a young teenager, so he wasn't really fit to rule and nobody, he didn't have any political support, nobody knew who he was. Uh, and let's see, mm, so during this kind of time of, of transition for Margaret, um, the King of Scotland, Malcolm III, travels down to the English court for royal business and um, he meets Margaret's family there. And she was 14 years old at the time, you know, very gracious, beautiful young lady and made a favorable impression on the Scottish king. But, you know, he pats her on the head and dismisses her as a, you know, little teenager and goes off his kingly ways back to Scotland. Um, this would be, this, this, this is an important meeting here, as we'll see later on. Uh, for, let's see, just a few years later, William the Conqueror arrives in England from Normandy. And if we know anything about this period of history, this is when uh, the French would um, take over England and rule for the next 200 years. And that began with William the Conqueror. At the ill-fated Battle of Hastings, uh, he defeated the English king, uh, that would be Edward the Confessor, and declared himself ruler of England. Uh, Margaret's brother Edgar was now declared king, but nothing happened with that. He was 15 years old, nobody knew who he was, it just kind of went nowhere. Uh, so I think there was another nobleman made king. He tried to meet William the Conqueror in battle, he failed, and England just became under, uh, uh, came under his rule. Uh, let's see. <laughs> so th by this time, uh, mm. so the, the, the family, Margaret's uh, family, they have to flee and into Scotland. Malcolm III right, gives them safe passage. He met them, he knew who they were. Okay, you can come into Scotland. Uh, they're, they're staying there just, just north of the border of England. And Margaret's mother, Agatha, decides, you know, this whole English thing is just not working out for me. I'm going back to Hungary. 
So uh, uh, Margaret's mother, Agatha, her sister and her brother, they all get on a boat and she, we're going to sail back to Hungary and just forget it where we're done. Uh, but this was not God's plans. Um, so as they attempted to cross the English Channel, a storm uh, drives their ship north and they were shipwrecked. Uh, they had to take refuge in a port city. And it turns out in that city, Malcolm III has his kingly castle. That's where he rules Scotland from. They were shipwrecked in his, ve in his very home port. Uh, so he goes and he meets them personally. And this time, let's see, um, uh, let's see, Margaret of Scotland is, she's not 14, she's 23. And she's not a cute little 14 year old, she's a beautiful woman. And now um, Malcolm III sees her and she leaves more than a favorable impression on the Scottish king. So he is swooning with love over Margaret and uh, asks her to marry him. Indeed, she accepts. And now uh, Margaret, who has been, she, was, she grew up in Hungary as an exiled princess for 12 years. Then she went to England and was uh, essentially a homeless uh, princess for another 12 years. And now finally, she becomes the Queen of Scotland. So uh, quite a, a change of events. I mean, exiled, father dies, wars, uh, f fleeing, shipwreck, storms, uh, proposals by a king. I mean, this, it's not, you, you complain about your life. Try being a princess, right? Or somebody in the royal court, right? You know, people are getting poisoned and there's all these, oh my goodness. So uh, it makes, makes you love normalcy. So, uh, so Margaret is now queen of Scotland and, and she finally has um, uh, the, the noble title and, and, the, and the position. And she, she just, she wore it so well. I think it's what, what, what Shakespeare talks about. Mercy befits a king more so than a crown. And so for a queen, right? Uh, uh, loveliness and kindness, uh, so much more befitting and, and such regal and queenly attributes. And all of her time in exile, I mean, she had all the, the, the um, you would say the manners and the upbringing of royalty, but, but all of the humility of a peasant. Uh, she was just nobody for the longest time. And so she combined the best of both worlds. And it was just, um, uh, it, it was uh, absolutely what Scotland needed. And it was, it was what Malcolm III needed. Now, here's an interesting thing about that relationship, uh, Margaret and Malcolm. And that would be, that was a love story that uh, kind of to this day is still um, uh, kind of resounds in England. Um, in fact, when Margaret would die um, and she would be declared a saint, uh, when they transferred her relics, they moved the bones of her husband, Malcolm, with her because they, he had, he, they had loved each other so much in life. They, they, could, they said, we can't separate the, the, the bones. They have to go together. So uh, that just kind of shows the depth of love they had. Uh, but you would say, well, why would this be? Well, Malcolm III has a history of his own. Uh, so he had been, he, he himself had, um, uh, he was uh, Scottish nobility, Scottish royalty. His father, uh, his name was Duncan and he had been king of Scotland, uh, but his father had been murdered by an evil, wicked, plotting man by the name of Macbeth. So Macbeth killed his father Duncan and sent Malcolm III into exile for 17 years. Uh, this was a famous story such that William Shakespeare would write about it in a play called Macbeth. So that's the story behind it. If you've ever heard of Macbeth, it was Malcolm III's family history. That was his story. That's not like a made up play. That's a real event. And now you know who it refers to. Uh, so uh, Malcolm uh, III uh, had spent 17 years in exile before becoming the, coming to himself to the Scottish throne. So what do you think he's feeling when he sees Margaret of Scotland and she's telling him, I grew up in exile and I was shipwrecked. This He's like an immediate connection. I was in exile too. I know what it feels like. They would have had that, that connection. So, so no, no surprise that, that they would have um, uh, felt that, that deep uh, love for each other. And uh, for this reason, Malcolm greatly admired Margaret. And um, she immediately began to improve the kingdom of Scotland by focusing on her primary task, which was her husband. And he, uh, although he had been through this difficult time, uh, he was a little bit brutish in his manners. You know, I mean, your country, I mean, the Scots are kind of a little bit brutish anyways. Um, they've been invaded by the Danes, by the Norwegians, by the Vikings, right? So it, it, he's a kind of a rough man and he is illiterate. He can't read either. So Margaret uh, sets about with, with her demeanor and her queenly uh, bearing, 
uh, she sets about improving his manners, and she reads to him. She reads to him from the Bible, uh, from, you know, I mean, you can imagine the Scottish annals or whatever it was. And so Malcolm just has this tremendous respect for his wife and, uh, and for her abilities. And so he begins to trust her with more and more royal power until she holds as much power in the kingdom as he does, right? And, and that's the way, like, that's, this is feminism, right? This is real feminism. Like, you, you, you don't have to be, women shouldn't be the president. It's like, I'm gonna marry the president and then he'll just do whatever I tell him because that's what, that's what, that's what wives are for, right? Um, in, in the original, uh, um, was it when, when Adam calls Eve, he calls her name. In Hebrew, the name he called her meant counselor, and that's what women are supposed to do. That's their proper role. I mean, they, they can rule, they can wield power, but it's, it's in the proper hierarchy. So, um, so Margaret, she, she's absolutely very well aware of this, and she just begins to administer the kingdom uh, um, uh, to great effect. Um, she um, plays a hugely important role in unifying the Scottish Catholic Church uh, which had drifted away from, from the Roman Catholic Church. There were some, uh, not quite heresies yet, but it was very much at variance. So she helped to restore and reform the practice of the liturgy and other things. She helped to rebuild monasteries and churches falling into disrepair. She encouraged, she invited other religious orders uh, into, the, into Scotland. She promoted the arts, she promoted education. Uh, she encouraged ecclesiastical synods and actually, she did, she did much of this with the cooperation of the Archbishop of Canterbury, who was William of Lanfranc. Uh, Lanfranc was, uh, um, uh, he had been bishop at the monastery of Beck, which was in Normandy. And when William the Conqueror came over, he invited uh, Lanfranc to come and be Archbishop of Canterbury. So there's all, all kinds of complicated historical stuff here, but God knows everything and he's working this all to great uh, um, uh, effect in the church. Uh, she was able to accomplish so much good uh, because of her personal piety, because of her daily prayers. She spent so much time in daily prayer. She did devotional reading. Uh, she would get up at midnight and read, recite matins. She would, there was a nearby cave uh, she would go into for solitude. And um, uh, see, fasting, she, would, she was quite sparing in her diet. And she and Malcolm would, would fast both for uh, um, uh, Lent and also for Advent. They observed those two periods of fasting times. Um, she did uh, ecclesiastical embroidery, right, for um, uh, vestments at Mass. And uh, interesting, let's see, um, one of the longest lasting works of charity she did um, was to establish a ferry system for pilgrims traveling to St. An Andrew's Cathedral. Um, there was either a long, arduous journey around or an expensive boat ride across this, this little channel of, of water. And so she made her ferry service, she subsidized it and paid for it with the king's revenue and made it affordable even for the poorest of pilgrims. So she was enabling their, um, them to um, engage in their works of piety. Uh, so there are two towns, or there's, there's a town, um, yes, named Queen's Ferry in Scotland, North Queen's Ferry and South Queen's Ferry, named after her. And the ferry service she started in the year like 10, I don't know, you know, 1090 or something, or you know, lasted for 900 years. That's how long her ferry service lasted. Like that. That's a pretty good legacy, right, to, to, to do something like that. So that's just an example of kind of some of the things that, that she was doing. And for 20 years, this continued, greatly benefiting from her charity and her goodness of this husband and wife team. Uh, but, you know, they, they had um, really a tragic ending. It was, it was very sad and very fast. Um, <clears throat> there was a small uprising in a part of Scotland. And so Malcolm III, and his oldest son are depart to respond to it. So he's gonna be about, her son is gonna be maybe 18 or 19 years old. Uh, and Margaret at this time, she was very sick and due, due in part to her frequent fastings and her, her great labors for the kingdom. And so she asked Malcolm not to go, you know, you have knights and, 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 and lords who can take care of that. It's a small uprising, you, you yourself don't need to be there. But he felt like it was his duty, it was his duty to be there. And he's a little bit older. I mean, he was, I think, 20 years older than Margaret was. So he, he's, he's quite a bit older than she is. He's probably in his 60s now. Um, but he feels he has to go, and so he brings his, their oldest son with him because he's gonna teach him, you know, this is how you, you have to deal with affairs of the kingdom. Uh, but sadly, um, it wasn't a very large uprising, but it was uh, contentious, and he was betrayed while on this mission. Uh, and he was murdered along with his oldest son. 
Um, so very much like Christ, right, who was betrayed by a friend, so too was Malcolm. And Margaret, for her part, uh, sadly, uh, in her weakened state when she heard of this news, uh, she died of grief. In four days, she herself died later. And the, in, you can imagine in Scotland, you know, this is the 11th century, news doesn't travel very fast. And so people hear the news, they hear the news that the, the king has died and the queen also has died, just in the, in the same news. Uh, it's very, very, very hard for the kingdom to take. Uh, however, uh, the good work they had be, both begun uh, continued uh, because of their, um, I could say, uh, they had six sons and two daughters, right? So another benefit of a large family, um, they were, that, that her, their progeny were able to carry on uh, piously in the faith and continue um, uh, that good work in Scotland. And in fact, I think the British royal couple today, the, um, uh, what's his name, uh, Charles, or who, not Charles, whatever, I, don't, I can't remember, who cares? I mean, uh, they are descended, like they can trace their lineage back to Margaret uh, and Malcolm. The third of Scotland, they have this some kind of connection back there. So, um, thus, thus the end of Margaret and Malcolm, as I said, that that husband and wife team, and she was canonized uh, 150 years later by Pope Innocent IV. And as I mentioned, her, her, her they're both their relics, um, or her relics were moved, and his were, were moved with them. Uh, but sadly, um, these relics were um, destroyed by the Protestant revolt in Scotland in the 1500s. But some, some relics were saved, however, and brought to France. So this, uh, some of her relics were saved and brought there to, to France. But those relics were destroyed by French revolutionaries in the revolution. So we have no relics of St. Margaret of Scotland. So thanks to the Protestants, right? Uh, really, it's just it's the, the anti-Catholicism, right? The anti-God attitude of those who don't accept the faith. Uh, so what, um, what an example, what a life of uh, St. Margaret. Um, and I would say, you know, it's, it's in times of strife where you persevere, where you learn uh, how to behave in, in, in when you have times of, I wouldn't say um, uh, goodness, but when, when you're in positions of power. You know, when you have an influence uh, of, of, to a great degree, you need a great degree of integrity to wield it well. Um, and I would say certainly uh, Margaret would have thought uh, in her times of exile, she would have thought of the Christ child in his exile when he was exiled to Egypt. She would have known, and this is, this is the beautiful thing about the life of Christ, it doesn't matter who you are, you will always find a personal connection with Christ to whatever's happening in your life. He was exiled royalty, he was a king of the Jews, and he was exiled by jealousy to a foreign land, just like Margaret was, just like Malcolm was. So that's the kind of, that's the kind of um, uh, meditations that we should have. Anybody who is suffering from anything, you can look to the life of Christ and find solace and comfort there. Um, I mean, even St. Anne and Joachim, right, the, the grandparents of our Lord, uh, they can be considered the patron saints of grandparents who can't see their grandchildren, right? Like, like what happened with, with COVID recently. People telling me, my, my kids won't let me see my child. Well, you know, St. Anne and Joachim, they know how you feel. That happened to them, right? So anybody, any circumstance, you can look to the life of Christ and you can find a connection. Uh, and so Margaret uh, of Scotland certainly would have, would have uh, been meditating upon this and understanding this. Um, uh, in, in her own exiles. But that, as I said, that's what made her to be an excellent uh, leader and uh, um, uh, we would say founder for, for, for Scotland, um, giving it the monasteries, education, learning, reading, and so on. Uh, right? That's how the modern world was built, was by uh, women like St. Margaret and, and men like Malcolm III who responded so well to that. Um, you know, so much more could, could be said, but um, uh, I, I will just leave, leave you with that and realize that, again, this is, um, her name means pearl, by the way, Margaret means pearl. Um, the, the, she's really a pearl, not just of Scotland, but, but of the church. These are our saints. We have a connection to St. Margaret, to, to um, you know, her husband. Anybody who gives their life over to the service of Christ, right, that's our family. Our, our, our mother, our father, our brothers, our sisters, and, and we can take pride in that, but we should also, we should feel a, a personal connection to them, right? That's, that's our, our friends, our example, and I've said this before, but we're affected by the people we know, and when you know the saints, they will affect you. Their example, and their lives, and their courage, and their sacrifice, and their faith, and, and their virtues, that will affect you. So get to know the saints, uh, real people, um, written about, right, by famous playwrights, 
uh, that's our family. So let us get to know them and let us not be afraid uh, to get to know each other also. Be charitable to each other. Uh, we are all united under uh, Christ. Uh, so God bless you all on this Feast of St. Margaret. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.